Hi there, welcome to your second lecture for week four. Uh, this lecture will be a slightly mini lecture on um, pop art, but most specifically on Andy Warhol, who you might consider the poster child for pop art. Here on this first slide, I've got a couple of quotes from pop artists that I really like because they sort of exemplify the spirit of pop art. Pop art, pop star, short for popular, and it's a movement or a kind of art that emerges really the early 1960s and embraces all the stuff that minimalist artists and the Abex uh, people before them had uh, rejected. This is an art that turns toward everyday mass popular consumer culture. And here, a couple of quotes from Warhol and Klaus Oldenburg that really exemplify the spirit of pop art, art uh, that, that embraces the lowbrow, the commercial, the kind of everyday, the accessible. Everything is beautiful, pop is everything. And then a famous line from Klaus Oldenbar, uh, Oldenburg, this idea of blurring the, the boundaries between art and life. And if you wanna pause and write these down, then that's fine. There's also some of this stuff, a few quotes from Warhol and Oldenburg, and then also a letter from Richard Hamilton, an English artist who's really credited with being the first pop artist uh, that are available on Blackboard for you to read this week. That'll give you a sense of the I wouldn't really call it philosophy of pop art because we're not talking about a real unified formal movement, but sort of the ideas that these artists who get classified as pop artists have in common. Here I'm showing you, and actually, as you can see, I said pop art starts to emerge in the 50s and 60s, but this is a much earlier example of the beginnings of pop art. Pop art, the term itself, was actually first coined in Britain in um, 1958 in an, an edition of Architectural Digest, and he was taught, and this critic in England was talking about post-war art that was centered on kind of consumerism and materialism. This is a nascent movement that begins in London, actually, rather than in New York, with artists like this guy, Eduardo Paolozzi, uh, who was a British citizen who was a child of Italian immigrants to, to um, Britain. Paolozzi was friends with another guy named Richard Hamilton, and these two artists were part of, um, they went to school together, and they started to play with alternative ways of making images. Now. If you took 20th century European art, you'll know that, for example, um, newspaper collages are not brand new in the 1940s. They're something that people had been experimenting with, like the Dadaists in, in um, Berlin, for example, had been experimenting with using images from co pop culture to um, and cutting stuff out of newspapers and magazines and then reassembling them in new ways to make a commentary on society. So it's not a brand new thing, but it's something that reemerges in the post-war period with um, with works like like this, Palazzi from 1948, immediately after the war, when, as this is kind of a theme in the immediate post-war period for Europeans and Japanese alike, that there aren't a lot of, uh, there isn't, the economies are still recovering, there isn't a lot of fine art material available, but this kind of um, pop culture effluvium, uh, you can see here, this is assembled from a variety of advertising images that would have been in popular magazines that and he's taken them kind of reassembled them in this you know kitschy funny sort of way with a title and this is from a series he called bunk uh, it's a psychological fact that pleasure helps your disposition a kind of title that sounds like it comes from a, some sort of advertisement maybe for um, you know some sort of product right his series, Ten Collages from Bunk, refer, and this is one of the series, Ten Collages from Bunk, um, the, the series refers to the idea that Henry Ford had said, history is bunk, we want to live in the present. Okay, and that's, uh, Henry Ford said that earlier in the 20th century, so this whole idea is, let's reject the past, let's live in the now, let's embrace what's going on around us. And part of what's happening as, like, it, as England recovers from the war is, a slow rebuilding of the economy, and a hopeful look toward the future. In 1948, in England, um, food is still rationed. Consumer products are not that widely available. So this is kind of a turn towards the possibilities of the future as England recovers. 
And this is an early example. He and his friend Richard Hamilton will be the sort of early ones from the um, from this group in London to start experimenting with this. And then it really becomes <coughs> um, a more sort of widespread approach to making art by the late 50s and early 60s. So here is another of Palazzi's... I was. Uh, this is from, again, from the um, Bunk series, the 10 collages from Bunk. And here you can see a couple of things going on, right? He's used not just um, advertising image, like the images like the Coca-Cola sign and the real gold seal, uh, but also he's used, let's see, on the bottom is a playing card, the kind of playing card that was... Um, given out by American servicemen to people in Britain during World War II. So it's just a piece of pop culture there that's being put into this collage. And then Intimate Confessions. Confessions was one of these kind of lowbrow um, supermarket tabloids that you could buy. The kind of thing that, you know, respectable people weren't supposed to have in their homes. Uh, you know, National Enquirer type of thing that he's using here. And then he's collaged on a... Um, image from probably some sort of comic book there, the gun with the um, the fake bang that says pop there. And again, pop, this is the word that's kind of coming into play to refer to pop art at this time. Um, and then the title of this image just comes from the True Confessions story that's listed there on the Intimate Confessions um, um, front page, right? I was a rich man's plaything. So part of his 10 collages from Bunk series incorporating mass media, advertising, lowbrow culture, uh, throwaway stuff, um, all this kind of, you know, um, readily available, easily accessible, easily understood, not psychologically anguished the way that you might think of the Fautriers of the world or the, the Jackson Pollocks of the world. This is a different response coming out of World War II to the aftermath of World War II. This is not going for the spiritual and not going for the expressive in that way, but going for, okay, let's reject all the past and let's just sort of deal with the here and now. Probably the first collage that gets credit for being a pop art collage is this by uh, Richard Hamilton, although people argue now back and forth over since they were friends and Palazzi had done the 10 collages from Bunk 10 years earlier, or eight years earlier, does Richard Hamilton deserve credit for this movement? And the one thing that's sort of um, on Richard Hamilton's side is he wrote a early, almost manifesto for pop art. Again, you can read it this week on Blackboard in the form of a letter to some friends of his about what pop art is and he had a whole list of what these things were and what they meant so this is a pop art collage taking a photograph of um, a friend's living room and then populating it with all sorts of imagery from from you've got a couple of cheesecake well you've got a cheesecake photo there on the right of the woman in the um, sitting on the sofa You've got a can of ham sitting on the table from an advertisement. You've got the bodybuilder from some sort of beefcake magazine. And there you can see he's holding a Tootsie Pop, right? And, of course, holding it at a strategic angle. So this is a typical part of pop art is to not only incorporate all this kind of lowbrow culture, but also to make these very jokey, um, playful sorts of references. You've got um, Al Jolson and the jazz singer being advertised out the back window of the apartment. You've got on the wall, framed as if it were high art, the cover of one of these true romance, trashy um, weekly tabloid magazines. You've got, instead of a ceiling, you've got the ceiling open to an image of um, the moon, right? I mean, it's just this kind of funny, jokey collage of... Um, collage of um, of advertising mass media pop culture images. The friend, by the way, who um, Hamilton's picture is based on the friend's living room, was the friend who had coined the term pop art in Architectural Digest. Okay, so that's a little bit of the background of the emergence of the, the term pop art in Britain and some early examples of the kind of um, consumerist, lowbrow culture that will be part of the 
the aesthetic of pop art. Today I want to talk about, as again I've called him the poster boy for pop art, who emerges in the 19, late 50s and early 60s as the, the real leader of this, uh, the American version of this movement. Uh, Andy Warhol, who was a commercial illustrator who had been born in Pittsburgh, 1928, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and had grown up in Pittsburgh, went to Carnegie Mellon and got a degree in fine arts and then moved to New York in the 50s and became a, a very successful commercial illustrator doing designs for, um, for a while he worked for RCA and did the designs for record albums, for record album covers. He did um, illustrations of shoes for major department stores like Bonwit Teller. He did do a little bit of window design um, for, for downtown department stores in New York City. He did illustrations for the major newspapers, advertising sections, and by the late, and he had won, actually, he won several awards for his work as a commercial illustrator. He will be the first artist who has made a living as a commercial illustrator who, instead of trying to hide that fact, will actually celebrate it, will actually take it from the commercial realm into the fine art realm blatantly and unashamedly and really kind of embraces the whole notion of being part of a commercial consumer world. It might interest you to know that both Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg had worked as window dressers, for example, but they never publicized that fact when they became successful as gallery artists. Jackson Pollock had actually worked as a magazine illustrator and had done um, tradi more traditional style paintings um, that became part of, of magazine illustrations in the 1930s and um, early 40s. But he would never have been telling you about that. And in fact, this is a fairly common thing up until Andy Warhol that people who were, we know as fine artists, worked at some point in the commercial uh, graphic design field or in window dressing, things like that, but never really let that be known. Warhol is going to go the opposite direction and basically try to, um, you know, just say that there's no real line between design and fine art or between commercial illustration and mass-produced objects and fine art. And a little bit the way that maybe somebody in Nouveau Realism or Arte Povera will question the whole notion of artistic genius. And again, this is a theme I think you can see developing in the contemporary period. Um, he will, just by the nature of the work that he does, start to, to toy with those ideas about what an artist is with a capital A. And one of the other interesting things about Warhol is by the end of his life, he died somewhat prematurely in the 80s from uh, complications from gallbladder surgery. But by the end of his life, he's become a very multimedia artist. I have some clips this week of films that he did in the 60s with his factory, his so-called factory, uh, that you can look at a couple of clips just to get a sense of some of the stuff that he did. Uh, he also sort of does a little bit of performance art, and he really turns the whole art of being an artist into a kind of um, meta-performance. So but we'll focus mostly on his early 1960s emergence as a leader in the world of pop art. Here is just an example of his early commercial work, his um, prize-winning commercial work from the 1950s. He was, uh, actually for a while he worked as an illustrator of shoes, and then he did a private edition of lithographs of shoes um, that were accompanied by poems uh, by a friend of his named Ralph Pomeroy. So here's just an example of the style of line drawing that he did as a commercial illustration or as a commercial illustrator. And as you'll see, I mean, some of this really bleeds over into when he becomes a, a known as a fine artist. Where Warhol starts to make a name for himself is when he starts to do these images that are tied to commercial culture, but he's not doing for a particular patron to be produced in newspaper ads. Early example of this is his Marilyn Diptych from 1962, where he's taken the image of Marilyn Monroe. Uh, actually, she had just died in August of 1962, and so he started to take her image and work with her image in the fall of that year and do um, a series of 
silk screens and lithographs of the image of Marilyn Monroe. So here in this diptych, diptych is just a traditional religious form of painting where you have two panels side by side that can be folded closed. So here, using that word, he's sort of implying some sort of quasi-religious message or idea, um, and probably ironically, for the image of Marilyn Monroe. And here, Monroe was the most photographed woman of the 50s and 60s. She was incredibly famous in her day. She still exists as somewhat of an icon, I think, as a style icon uh, for people 40-some years after her death. But she was a really good early example of the enormity of post-war celebrity. Her image was everywhere. In newspapers, she was photographed all the time. She was in magazines every month. She was on the big screen. People were following her life in the gossip papers all the time. She was an early example of the kind of modern celebrity that we've become very used to with people like Lindsay Lohan and Britney Spears, for example. So here, he's taken an image of hers from her last film, um, or from, excuse me, not her last film, but from a 1953 film that she had done called Niagara. He's taken a publicity still and repeated it over and over and over on this lithograph, or on this, excuse me, this is a silk screen. Um, kind of playing with the whole idea of the, the, you know, the repetition of her image everywhere. On the one side, you've got her in color, right, or in technicolor, if you will. On the other side, you've got her in black and white, and you can see, although it's a repeated image of Marilyn, it is um, one in which some, in some cases her, out, her image is almost completely obliterated. Now, formally, this may be some sort of comment on the kind of cult of celebrity that was developing at this time, and Warhol was really very much in touch with how post-war mass media was developing and how um, what, what kind of effect on the popular culture this was going to have. And, of course, he was very in tune with this, too, because he's working as a commercial illustrator within that realm. Warhol is the person who said, very famous quote, probably the most famous quote from Andy Warhol, in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. And when he said that in the 60s, people thought he was being really kind of a, you know, a kook. But, of course, in some ways, media theorists now think in some ways what he said has come to pass. If you think of all the reality shows we have and all the cable news channels and how, um, you know, how pervasive the media is in people's lives, it, it almost seems like he has, he had really hit the nail on the head. In the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. So here you've got the diptych, life and death, color in black and white, um, the, this icon or this sort of religious format of the diptych painting, um, probably referring in some ways to the idea of death and the cult of celebrity, which are two themes that are very, very prominent throughout Warhol's fine art work. Here from the, again, late that year, another example. It's from that same series. This is the gold Marilyn Monroe from 1962, late 1962, where you can see he has done a um, gold canvas referencing the idea of the Byzantine icon and then silk screened one of those Niagara photos um, onto, the, onto the center of the canvas. So it's a commercial, it's also, of course, commercial technique that's being used here for logos and things like that, silk screening, that gives this picture a kind of artificial, crisp look, um, really playing on the visuals of celebrity culture from this time. Warhol didn't only treat celebrities like Marilyn Monroe in these early works, but he also turns to other parts of consumer culture. In this case, it's a, um, I believe this is a silk screen from 62, Green Coca-Cola, where it's a kind of monochromatic with slight green because Coke bottles had this greenish tint to them when they used to be made out of glass. Um, so Coke bottles repeated, and actually he did a whole series of Coke bottles in different um, colors, and then sometimes in, um, you know, you'd have a hundred Coca-Colas or um, Cokes in different colors, things like that from 62. Uh, here, just to give you a flavor of where Warhol's philosophy is coming from. <clears throat> it's a quote from him about this image. What's great about this country 
is that America started the tradition where the richest consumers buy essentially the same things as the poorest. You can be watching TV and see Coca-Cola, and you know that the president drinks Coca-Cola, Liz Taylor drinks Coca-Cola, and just think, you can drink Coca-Cola too. A Coke is a Coke, and no amount of money can get you a better Coke than the one the bum on the corner is drinking. All the Cokes are the same, and all the Cokes are good. Liz Taylor knows it, the president knows it, the bum knows it, and you know it. So there's Andy Warhol on why he's celebrating something like Coke as this kind of great democratic consumer product. And here, even the form itself, where you've got this, you know, con this repetition of the same image over and over and over again, just like you have the repetition of the same image over and over and over again in consumer culture. So he's mimicking the consumer culture that this is coming from. Unlike his predecessors, he's suggesting that this is something to be celebrated. It's something to be foregrounded. It's something to associate yourself with. And he's taking an everyday object like a Coke bottle and suggesting that it is a work of art. It's in the same early 60s, 62 and 63, that Warhol makes his real big breakthrough with a show at the Fierce Gallery in Los Angeles, which was a show of what probably is his most famous series of works. That is a series of Campbell Soup paintings that he did in the 60s. Now, these are paintings, okay? He starts out by doing Campbell Soup paintings on uh, oil on canvas paintings, where he takes the different flavors of Campbell's soup and does individual portraits of each can of each flavor of soup in a blown up oil on canvas format where he is suggesting that there is something important about Campbell's soup important enough to take this everyday supermarket object and put it into the realm of and in the media of the fine arts so he did a series of these, 32 of these oil paintings. Now, like the minimalists, he does a series. They're all the same size. They're all the same subject. They're all the same media, but with a very different effect. Here, instead of a work being just about itself, it's a work that's celebrating the daily, every day of consumer culture. Here's another oil on canvas, and you can see here this is one that, it's a very large canvas, and, and it's one where he has taken all the flavors available of Campbell's soup and put them into this oil can or this oil painting and he liked this because he said it looks like how you display them in the grocery store you know here is what the original gallery installation in 62 looked like at the oh sorry not Ferris Fergus gallery in Los Angeles so here it is um, and as you can see they're all hung at the same eye level. They're all hung on essentially what looks like a shelf, like they would be in a supermarket. They're, it, they're all the same size. They're equally spaced distance from one another. So they are kind of playing with both the formal qualities of something like minimalism and then the idea of the mass marketed same object available on store shelves. The 32 canvases, by the way, refer to all 32 flavors of Campbell's Soup that were then being sold by the Campbell's Soup Company. In the Fergus Gallery show, they were introduced, or they were, they were lined up according to the chronology in which um, Campbell's Soup had introduced them. So tomato was the first one because that was the first soup that um, they had created in 1897. So there's a couple of things going on here. At one, at the one time, they're you know the uniformity, they're ubiquitous, they're um, the same, they're repetitious. At the same time, they're kind of poking fun at the idea of oil painting as a notion, as a medium for invention, for originality, for uniqueness and singularity. Uh, and of course, visual repetition of this kind is pretty much standard operating procedure for advertisers. Warhol said of Campbell's Soup. I used to drink it. I used to have the same lunch every day for 20 years. I guess the same thing over and over again when somebody asked him about the Campbell's Soup. Here's just another view of Campbell's Soup. I think these are actually in the Warhol Museum now, so you can see them, again, lined up all the same size, even though the labels actually have different, you know, the different flavors of soup on them. They're the same. They're ubiquitous. They're repetitive, etc., etc. Uh, interestingly, 
The Campbell Soup Company early on considered suing Andy Warhol for copyright violation because, of course, their logo and their Campbell Soup design, that can design had been around for, well, since the 1890s. Uh, but they decided ultimately not to sue because, uh, for copyright infringement because the Campbell Soup series got them so much good publicity. He moved on to do oil paintings like this, where you see the cans in various states of being opened, the labels being torn off. He also did um, some of these Campbell soup in neon colors and played with the image over time to um, play with ideas of repetition and uniqueness and originality. And there's just another view of Campbell soup so that you can see the, the scale of the paintings. Oh, and here, as I was saying, um, Campbell's had originally considered suing him for copyright infringement, ended up not doing that because his, his series became such good publicity for them and helped to make their soup labels even more iconic. And ironically, after Warhol died, uh, his estate established a museum. It's actually a great museum in Pittsburgh, his hometown which is just chock full. It has the Warhol archives there and then it has tons and tons of images. And it is partially funded by the Campbell Soup Company. So they actually developed a really good relationship with Warhol and with Warhol's estate. And Campbell's, I don't know if they're doing it anymore, but they used to have every year an Art of Soup contest. And um, this is the 1998 winner. As you can see, it's Campbell Soup, the more modern, um, more modern, packaging of some sorts of fancier gourmet Campbell soups that here have been turned into an oil painting of stamps. So they're again playing on the idea of repetition and seriality and uniqueness and all of that. So this was the winner in 1998. So just kind of interesting to see how Warhol went from being a um, commercial artist to a really major name in fine arts and did it without ever apologizing for being commercial or for having a commercial artist or commercial illustrator's background and instead of rejecting all of that, really embracing the mundane of everyday life, of consumer culture, and of celebrity culture. And he really was engaged with, um, you know, questioning the media and thinking about the media and then using the media as a subject matter for his work. For example, here's a silkscreen that he took. Um, the image just came from a photograph of an accident that was published in the newspaper. It's called Death Five Times, 11 times in orange. The Death Five Times refers to the fact that this is a photograph of an accident scene in which five people had died. And although you can't see it very well in this image, it's actually a fairly gruesome picture of this uh, accident scene that was published in the newspaper somewhat callously almost. You can see um, dead and broken people laying under the car and in the back of the car. And so here he's taken this kind of salacious image that was published in the newspaper. The five times death is the number of people dead in the image. Okay, And here he's reproduced it 11 times on an orange background. With the idea of the infinite reproduction of the object being um, and this is something that, of course, also, if you go back and think about what Walter Benjamin said about the um, repetition of, of, of images draining them of their meaning and of their aura and of their power, that seems to be part of what Warhol is playing with. I say that, although I will warn you that Warhol is very hard to pin down because, and as you'll see when you watch these little clips of him this week, he's very much of a jokester and a game player. And in interviews, you know, he would he would really say, and one of his famous quotes is, you know, if you want to know anything about Andy Warhol, just look at the paintings. There's nothing behind it. I'm all surface. Uh, he, another interview, he said, I love plastic. I want to be plastic. You know, um, he, he was very sort of like tried to deny that there was anything going on with his work. But sometimes it's hard not to see there being some deeper meaning in the stuff that he did. So um, and he really reminds me a little bit of Marcel Duchamp playing with all these ideas about originality and the ready-made and the notion of the artist is genius. Um, he's very much a player of games, which I think you'll see when you um, see these. I've got a couple of short clips of Warhol in different interviews that I think give you a flavor of what he was like. 
in fact, you know, his book of philosophy, which is um, still in print, I think you can get it. We might even have it in the library. It's called The Philosophy of Andy Warhol, From A to B and Back Again. So just to give you a sense of what a, you know, sort of, he insisted on the whole idea that he was shallow and that there was nothing behind his work, uh, very much playing with this, with this whole idea. Okay, so speaking of seriality and pop culture and celebrity and all of that, he also in 1962 did this series of Elvises, and this is one example. This is actually a shot of the Elvis silk screens installed in the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. This particular version is Elvis 11 times, and it's taking a publicity still from a film that Elvis had done a few years before called, let me find it, Flaming Star, a 1960 Western that he had done called Flaming Star. And there he is in this publicity photo standing there, legs akimbo, gun drawn, getting ready to, um, you know, very macho challenge you to something, right? And here, of course, this black and white and silver background referring to the notion of the silver screen. And again, this is at when Elvis Presley, like Marilyn Monroe, is really at the height of his fame. And, I mean, just incredibly famous. Um, people obsessed with knowing all about Elvis uh, in this modern cult of celebrity. So this repetition of the image, kind of re referring to the idea of the, you know, frames of a film, uh, the repetition of his image in public, and things like that. There's also, interestingly, um, just to note, flaming is old slang for the idea of a person who's out of the closet, homosexual, and um, is, you know, is um, not ashamed and not shy about it, okay? And so this ties into a little bit of the question of Warhol's own sexuality and whether or not he's making oblique references to things like his own sexuality in images like this. I think it's worth considering because, again, uh, you should be reading this article that was written about a Warhol retrospective, very critical of the retrospective, saying that it never incorporated this important aspect of uh, Warhol's biography into any discussion of or criticism of the art that he produced. And I, I recently read an article that was suggesting that there may be something going on here with this hyper macho image, with this sort of phallic gun being out, and the notion that this was from a movie called Flaming Star, that maybe there's oblique references going on here um, to Warhol's own life. He did, let's see, this is another example of one of these Elvis silk screens. So this is a better, you can see the, the image a little better here. Um, you know, I'll let you take it with a grain of salt, but it is something worth thinking about. This is a, an issue that gets raised time and again, and so we have to figure out how much of what we understand about an artist and what their work means comes from historic context or biographical context or the formal relationships between one artist and another or, you know, art history itself. So it's something to kind of file away and think about there. And here's another example of Elvis from this Elvis series where he's taking that same found image and reproducing it again and again. Again, in the early 60s, Warhol does more art that like bridges the gap between popular culture and fine art and really interrogates that boundary, I would say. So here is an Andy Warhol painting called Do-It-Yourself Flowers. It is uh, an uh, paint on canvas, quite large as you can see, 69 by 59 inches. It is a one-of-a-kind, custom-made by Andy himself, takeoff on the notion of paint-by-numbers paintings. Paint-by-numbers kits were very popular in the post-war period. They, they were selling in the millions every year. You can still buy paint-by-numbers, but it's not as ubiquitous as it was in the 1950s and 60s, I think. Uh, and paint-by-numbers, actually the biggest company that made paint-by-numbers, their slogan was, I think I mentioned this when we looked at Jasper John's Do-It-Yourself Target, uh, their slogan was, Every Man a Rembrandt. And so this is something that clearly artists like Warhol are thinking about and, you know, playing with a little bit. So here, I mean, this isn't an actual paint-by-numbers kit. This is something that he created. So it's not, you know, so it's even playing with that whole, um, that whole disjuncture. 